Super excited to have Chris Lamatini here today. Um, yeah, so we, as we brainstorm shock, somebody brought up Chris, and um, I'll be honest, I, I wasn't, I didn't know about Chris's work, and um, we looked it up, and I, I watched his work, and I was like, yes, this is shocking. Let's, <laughs> yes, <laughs> let's bring Chris on. So we're really honored that uh, he said yes. Um, for those of you not totally familiar with Chris, um, get with it. And also, to let you know who he is, um, so Chris is a horror filmmaker based here in Baltimore. He's also the creative director at 15.4, um, which is a digital ad agency. Um, so essentially, Chris makes ambitious, low-budget horror films. You could also call them morbid comedies. Sometimes he refers to them as morbid rom-coms, I believe. Um, he definitely has a taste for like the esoteric, the weird, um, the absurd, the un unpredictable, um, which I, I really enjoy that, that part of, of watching you sort of navigate a storytelling effort. Um, I think Chris's work says be careful who and what you get attached to. And he really does explore this idea of shock in a way that's, that's really interesting. And um, I'm really excited to hear what Chris has to say about that. So I'm going to get off the stage. Thank you guys so much for uh, um, letting me be up here for so long. And uh, please welcome Chris. All right. All right. So we're going to get started here. Um, does this just click through? Yeah, cool. All right. So guys, um, this is actually an interesting lecture to, uh, topic to speak on for me because uh, how people perceive shock is very, very different. It's very um, individualized for every person. I think what's shocking to me might be vastly different to what's shocking to you. And in this lecture, I want to touch some of the things because we have a lot of different um, creative, creative, um, creative creators. That sounds terrible. <laughs> creative, um, creative avenues. You know, some people are from agencies. Some people are artists. Um, so hopefully this provides value to your morning, hopefully. So, like I said, what's shocking is different to every single person in this room. What's shocking to me could be totally different than the person in the back row. But also, we have a range of shocks. Uh, it starts at the simple sort of gross-out shock. Like, when I get out of my car and I almost step on a dead rat, that's, that's the, the low, intense, quick shock, right? Um, which happens a lot in Baltimore City. Um, and... Uh, then it also goes to the, I think the other end of the spectrum is the profound gut punch shock. Like when I figure out how much my insulin is going to cost. Um, so that sort of insults your belief system. That's something that's deeply unsettling. Now, uh, whether it's the low-level gross out or the deep-seated gut, pu gut punch, shock forces reaction. Uh, both in practice and by definition, if it doesn't make you react, it is, it's simply not shocking, right? So it's appropriate in an age where everyone is focused on user engagement and audience interaction that shock style tactics are being used to um, connect with, with your audience. Uh, they draw attention to entertainment, you know, political ideas, brands of all kinds. Shock is not new. Uh, and now there's an excess of voices using it because they have to compete in an oversaturated market. Uh, it's one of the reasons why pretty much almost every article you, you'll see has a clickbait style headline. Something to grab your attention and promise you uh, <laughs> shocking anti-aging secrets. Um, that, that actually looks really cool to me. Uh, <laughs> I don't care about what the product does, but I, I would enjoy seeing that picture. Uh, so, <laughs> so why am I here talking about shock, right? What credentials do I here have that, uh, that make me an authority on the subject? Well, for the past uh, decade, I've been producing low-budget horror comedies in Baltimore, Maryland, right here. Uh, to date, I've produced seven, and I'm currently directing number eight right now. We're halfway through production on a film actually appropriately titled uh, What Happens Next Will Scare You. And it's a, it's, a, it's a satire of clickbait culture. It's a horror satire of uh, you know, sensationalism online and in marketing. So let's talk about horror movies real quick. Why, um, I, well, let me clarify that. 
Making horror films that stand out against a cluttered marketplace is actually a very difficult feat. I mean, there's new horror films getting produced every day, and I'm one of many, many people doing this stuff. Um, and I think one of the reasons I've managed to make a name for myself is because I've tried to shock audiences in a way that stands out against the rest of my com uh, contemporaries. So. Here's the question for everyone out there telling stories, whether that means you're a filmmaker, uh, a brand strategist, an illustrator, any type of creative. How do you shock in an age where everything is screaming for your attention? In my opinion, it's not about volume, it's about orchestration. I'm gonna run down the list of how I've manipulated shock to tell compelling stories and draw audiences in, um, because it's not about the amount of blood or nudity that have been in my films. Uh, basically, I've been able to create memorable, effective shocks by creating empathy, by rearranging context, and by reversing audience expectation. And so can you. <laughs> <laughs> so, here we go. Creating empathy. Um, this is actually, I, I'm going to tell a quick anecdote that's not on my, my, not in my notes. Um, this scene was actually taken out of, by the way, I think Frank, the Frankenstein monster, I know he's different than Frankenstein, but for, for efficiency's sake, I might just say Frankenstein instead. Um, so I, my apologies to monster enthusiasts. Um, <laughs> Frankenstein is probably, the Frankenstein monster is probably the most empathetic of all the, the universal classic movie monsters just because of like this idea of discovery and figuring out how the world works, right? And I think this scene is really interesting. Side note to this scene, um, this was cut out of the film for a long, long time. When this film came out in, I believe, 1932, this scene where he talks to this little girl, they start throwing daisies in the, in the, the pond, and then he ends up picking her up and throws her into the pond because he doesn't understand how, how humanity works. Um, that, <laughs> uh, that, that scene was cut out for a long time. It was, it was one, of the, one of the early censors of those Universal Monster movies. Okay, so, total different tangent, sorry. Some people just don't get horror movies. They sort of see them as an exercise in how much sex and violence you can put on a screen. And uh, I disagree with that. I think there's, there's immense cultural value in horror films. And I'm going to paraphrase Stephen King when I say that horror films don't celebrate death. They celebrate life. Um, it's the living, breathing human element that elevates the emotional response to a great horror story because it makes death so much more powerful. When we care about the characters in a story, we have a greater investment in that narrative. Now, in my films, I've always strived to create empathetic, um, really relatable characters because most horror movies simply don't have them. Uh, it's, 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 it's really laziness on the part of the, the filmmaker, and sometimes it's just, it's, 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 it happens way too much. And I think rather than a tragedy for the audience, you get an itinerary list for the monster, and that's really fucking boring. So, if you really want to shock someone, and I mean profound shock, not the gross out, they have to care. A great example of this is a PSA I saw recently, and um, maybe you guys have seen it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna paint the picture for you. So it's a mother and a daughter uh, driving driving along, and the little girl's in the back seat. She's probably like maybe like probably two years old. When when do kids stop using car seats? What? This is not a quiz. Okay, <laughs> you're fucking wrong. <laughs> We're taking your children away. <laughs> This has all been a cunning ruse. All right, uh, so, uh, <laughs> Jesus. So, uh, <laughs> man, I'm so glad I'm going off my topic points. All right, um, so, so it's this mother and daughter in, um, in driving, and, and she, the, the, the daughter's in the back seat, and the sun shines through the window. It's beautiful, it's gorgeous, and the mom is taking pictures of her daughter um, from the rearview mirror, saying, oh, my gosh, you look so cute. I am going to post this immediately. And, uh, you know, you can just see the, the warmth in her mother's pride, and she goes to post it. And then, uh, wham! A tractor trailer comes and hits them. And it's an anti-texting commercial. And uh, <laughs> that is unsettling. It's disturbing. And it, I would say that's shocking. Um, I, I, I don't think I'll ever make a film as shocking as any anti-texting commercial. <laughs> Maybe that's what I should strive for next. I'll just make a 90-minute uh, anti-texting commercial. <laughs> so, um, actually, I th actually, I think I heard somebody was telling me recently that Warner Herzog actually just did that, made an anti-texting documentary. Is that, is that, that, yeah, I'm sorry, but yeah, <laughs> someone, my wife. <laughs> But literally, that's what I think about every time I, uh, that thing, that's what I think about every time I, uh, I get a text when I'm driving. I just think about that commercial, and I feel terrible. Uh, 
Would that spot have been as memorable with the, with the, uh, the mother and child not having that sweet interaction up front? There's no way. Uh, creating empathy makes shocks memorable. And I was supposed to show you that real quick, but it's really upsetting, so let's move on. Because, <laughs> um, you know, we, we all had that delicious black sauce breast breakfast. I want to keep it down. <laughs> um. All right, rearranging context. This one's a lot of fun. <laughs> Where are we going with this, Chris? Let's, let's, <laughs> let's get there. <laughs> all right. I think one of the reasons why shocking subject matter is often dismissed is because it lacks meaningful context, and therefore it doesn't carry the same emotional weight. I think one of the reasons why I was sort of turned off um, initially about trying to write a lecture about shock is because I think shock for shock's, shock for shock's sake is really stupid. Um, it's very lazy. So, case in point, a urine sample cup sitting on a desk in a doctor's office. That's not shocking, right? All right, well, let's take that same urine sample cup and let's pour it over the head of a congressman who demands mandatory drug testing for welfare recipients. I think that's shocking. You know what I mean? Because it proves a point, and it's fun, and it, and it's, it, you know, it takes the piss out of you. It puts it on you. Um, so I, I was really trying not to get through this lecture without making a stupid joke or pun. Well, stupid jokes were inevitable. Puns I was trying to stay away from. Um, okay. So shock is equal parts content and context. And if the two aren't working together, you're not closing the loop. I'm going to go pivot for a second to discuss some work I've done with the digital agency I work for as a creative director. Um, just one quick correction. I'm one of uh, a couple creative directors at 154. I don't want to take credit for all the stuff we do because I'm a part of an amazing team there, really fucking talented people there. Um, so this involves a political action spot I directed last year. It was part of a social media campaign designed to draw attention to climate change legislation. Now, we all know that climate change deniers are categorically uh, batshit crazy. And without any help from our copywriters, what they were saying was shocking. <laughs> um, we literally took, we could look at speeches from like, you know, these, these conservative congressmen and senators and it was just like, man, this is fucking gold. Um, so, you know, th what they were saying was already shocking. Grown men willfully ignoring science is insanely shocking. But how could we draw attention to their childish misunderstanding of environmental issues? Well... <laughs> we would have actual children say the stupid things our adult leaders were saying. We took shocking content and emphasized the absurdities by rearranging context and delivering a clear, impactful message. The end result garnered a fantastic response. It got us on the front page of Upworthy. It had a ton of viral video potential. And uh, it, to the best of my knowledge, it's the most views 154 has ever actually gotten on um, a video piece like that because it, it was just so many aggregators were picking it up and, and reposting it. And that was really, really awesome. And I think the thing here is, like, you know, plenty of political uh, attack ads, um, they use shock and they use scare tactics. Uh, and some use it effectively. Uh, but, you know, I think the key here was we were shocking and funny. And I think the, the, the pivot of context, we didn't, we didn't just say, these guys are shocking. We made it obvious how shocking we, we were by how we flipped the conversation, how we flipped the context. And that's what made it memorable. All right, next one. Reversing audience expectation. Great storytelling is about reversing audience expectation. Um, shocking art does the same thing. It disrupts what you think is a given. A great storyteller will uh, take a plot beat and flip it on its head. When the same storyteller employs um, shock tactics to twist the plot, it's sort of like doubling down. It's all in. Horror filmmakers are uniquely positioned here. But just like going back to my original question that I proposed, um, how do you shock in a genre where shock is commonplace? How do you shock when shock is expected? So I want to talk about um, arguably the most um, visceral reaction I've ever got from any film um, that I've made. So there's a scene at the end of Call Girl of Cthulhu, um, the last film I finished. Um, it's a scene of true vulnerability. And I don't mean vulnerability, vulnerability like a woman walking down a dark hallway in a negligee with the fucking candelabra and the winds whistling and the lights flickering. It's not like that. This is about emotional vulnerability, right? So it's, the end of the, it's toward the end of the film, and these two characters have gone through some pretty intense stuff, and they decide to profess their love to each other. And the scene, it's a really tender scene of confession, and it ends in a death. And I don't want to spoil it. Um, but what was really interesting was when we, because of the emotional weight we tied in the scene and because people thought we weren't going to do what we did, it gets one of the most shocked reactions I've ever got. Like literally when we're at film festivals, you know, um, it'll be toward the end of the film and Melissa and I will be out in the lobby waiting and um, we'll hear the audience go, oh, 
I mean, like, like erupt, and I'll be like, oh, fuck, we better go to the bathroom. We have, like, five minutes before the movie's over. Like, we use it as, a t as like, an egg timer. Um, and that was, that was, it was, it was really cool. It was really, really cool. Um, so, that scene shocks because the audience thinks the worst is over. And there's no way that story would pivot from first kiss to, I'm not going to spoil it uh, if you haven't seen it. Um, <laughs> But simply put, it pulls the rug out from underneath the audience because they have that added emotional weight between these two characters they've come to love, right? So, you want to uh, shock a contemporary horror audience? You create memorable characters that the audience falls in love with, then you kill them. <laughs> um, this is a... <laughs> I... I don't really have any reason to put that slide in there. I just love telling this story. Um, <laughs> that's my wife. Uh, we met Making Call Girl. She was the lead actress. I'm not a creep. I married her. She's wonderful. <laughs> and, um, and that's her under a couple hundred pounds of, um, of foam latex. <laughs> and um, that's, 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 it's, this is in close proximity to the scene I just talked about. So that's relatable enough, right? <laughs> um, but in all sincerity, uh, the great shock for, for me about Call Girl was that uh, I made a romantic comedy and then I dressed it up as a monster movie. And um, that took some serious strategy. So I'm going to pivot back. And uh, so how do you shock in an age where everything is screaming for your attention? Well, you have to know your audience. You have to understand their motivations and their needs. And you have to build their trust before you disrupt it. So what's shocking is a constant evolution. Um, but shock itself is never going away. Uh, using shock successfully is about creating empathy, it's about rearranging context, and it's about reversing audience expectation. Um, so, can art still shock? Yes, and I think it's really obnoxious when people say there's nothing shocking anymore. Like, that's like ridiculous. If, if, you're, if you're not shocked at anything, you're not looking around you. Um, but we have to constantly reimagine the ways um, we can keep shock fresh and effective. Um, and it's seriously, as long as there's humanity, there will be shock, and that shouldn't surprise anyone. Guys, thank you so much. Uh, Creative Morning, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. This was a lot of fun.